In my city, there's a local dog park that is one of, if not the only park, that will let, let you take your dogs off a lead, and it's specifically for dogs and their owners. It's a short walk from my house, and there's plenty of local dog courses that happen there, and some free paid and so on. I had gotten a standard poodle puppy earlier that year, and had been attending a variety of these classes, and visiting the park for a while, and had gotten to know, or at least recognise, most of the regulars and their doggies. I'd also experienced a few creeps, but none really stood out or terrified me, like this one man did. I arrived at the park around 4 after work, and other obligations like I usually did, and let my doggies off lead, throwing some toys, practicing some training, saying hello to the other regulars who were also starting to arrive. Typical stuff, you know? After a while of walking around, I sat down on one of the benches, on a small hill overlooking the park, and my doggies came to sit with me and get some water. As I was giving them a drink, I noticed a man approaching us. He was not trying to sneak up on me or anything, and when he saw I had noticed him, he smiled and waved, greeting me from a distance, before he came up the hill. He seemed friendly, and I thought he was just walking by. Plenty of people cut through the park to the gates at the top to avoid taking the longer route around the block. One of my dogs, a collie named Belle, immediately started growling and barking at him. But I dismissed this and shushed her because she's a rescue who was treated terribly by her last owners, and this is usually how she reacts to anyone she doesn't know. But rather than go quiet at my command like she usually does, she just transferred to a low growl. The man finally came up to where I was sitting, but rather than continue past, he stopped and started talking to me. It was then that I noticed he spoke in a way typically associated with gay men. His gestures also implied this, and maybe it was me being biased, but this put me a little at ease and made me less suspicious. He also dressed a little strangely, I remember. It was a humid, slightly windy day, but he was wearing jeans, a hat like the Peaky Blinders, don't know how else to describe it, sorry a large trench coat with what looked like layers underneath and a coloured scarf. He looked professional and well put together with an expensive watch and shoes to boot. At least I assume expensive from what I saw. He greeted me politely and complimented my dogs and I returned his niceties, still wondering what he may have wanted. He then said that he had seen a dog by the entrance of the park, hadn't seen its owner anywhere and was concerned. This immediately got more of my attention, and I asked him what kind of dog it was. Although I was not especially concerned, it is an awfully dog park after all. Maybe it just wandered a little way, and its owner who was sitting on a bench or chatting to someone. The man explained it was a Maltese poodle, and he'd hung around a bit, but had not seen anyone tend to it. At that point, an older lady walking behind us with the doggies overheard and came over to ask about it as well. He explained what he had seen to her as well. While they were talking, I got up and left, partly to check on the unattended dog, but also to give my dog Belle some respite, as she hadn't stopped growling and was getting more agitated with the little group forming. Her and my poodle pup followed after me happily as I made my way, not bothering to look back, and went down to where the man said he'd seen the dog. I saw it and immediately relaxed. I recognised it and knew the owner of that dog wouldn't be far, and sure enough, when I glanced around, I spotted him climbing up the steps from the little parking lot of the park. He had a golf bag with him, which was mainly why he stood out enough for me to recognise him. He would let his dog out to run while he got his stuff, and then he would whack a few balls, which his little white puff would end up speed off to retrieve. It was honestly adorable. I then noticed the trench coat man appearing and the woman he had been chatting to also arrived and they went over and chatted to the golf bike guy who seemed to confirm to them the dog was his. Trench coat guy glanced around and when he noticed me he immediately came over and told me that the Maltese belonged to that man and I said I know and explained a bit about him. I figured that would be the end of the interaction and I turned off with my pupper now playing with some other dogs. Well, Belle watched quietly a little away from me, but no. This guy followed, falling into a stride next to me and introducing himself. I responded politely but kept walking. He continued beside me now, 
suddenly chatting about how he was visiting from the Berg, which made sense why I had not seen him before, and talking about his family. He was gushing unprompted information at me, but I assumed he was just being friendly, or an open person. Honestly, something about him just didn't sit right with me, but I had no idea what. No reason to be suspicious, and try to be polite, which is why I didn't just tell him to F off, hoping he would put it together by my unenthused responses. He started asking me questions. How long had I lived in the area, or was I just visiting? Did I come to this park often? Was my family also in the area? I answered vaguely, just because he was coughing up his life story didn't mean I had to. My vague answers made him back off a bit, and he began gushing about himself again telling me how his family were renting a house nearby and going so far as to give me the actual address before asking me, where do you live? I'm not stupid enough to give my address out to random strangers, so I just said I lived in the area and had been there a while. His response was silence, and when I looked at him, he was just staring at me. It gave me the creeps. However, my gut started to twist a bit when he began again, more about himself, followed by more probing questions about my life and details about where I lived. He was so casual and smooth about it, I was really questioning myself for having such paranoid feelings. But I definitely felt uncomfortable and made an excuse of needing to check on my dogs to literally run away from the man. And it worked for about three minutes until as I straightened up from petting my puppy and calling Belova, I turned to see him right next to me again that friendly, disarming smile on his face again. He complimented me on my dog and said he was sorry to bug me again. He said he hadn't seen a poodle before and asked to get my fluffy little pup. I was hesitant, but he was so smooth, seemingly kind and polite, I couldn't think of an excuse and said yes. He bent down to pet him and started asking me questions about him while littering in some compliments. It was disarming and made me feel a little bad. Maybe he wasn't such a creep. Maybe I was being paranoid. I relaxed a little and answered some of his questions. But a comment of his made my gut twist all over again. He said he would love to bring his dog here and I blinked. Why wasn't his dog here? In fact, who goes to a dog park without their dog? My brain tried to justify it, but I froze a little as a wave of unprompted unease washed over me. I called Bell again as the man stood from petting my pup, and I scooped him up and took out Bell's lead. She came over, but when she noticed the man beside me, she lowered her head and hunched up her body, growling lowly as she did a half circle around us and to the left of me. I agreed with her at that point. This guy put a perfect front, but something about him was off, and my gut was telling me to leave. I walked up to her, hooked her up, and told him I was leaving and promptly strode off. I felt much better, but as I was walking, Belle was acting funny and twisting around. I refused to look back, assured her verbally and powered forward until I got to the stairs. Belle suddenly began growling again and it felt like a cold hard ball had dropped into my gut when Trenchcoat Guy fell in steps beside me going down the stairs. He didn't say a word, and my brain tried to justify it as him just happening to leave at the same time as me, while my instinct screamed at me to get as far as fucking could from this man as soon as possible. Whatever part of my brain had tried to justify the man leaving with me went dead quiet when Trenchcoat Man proceeded to follow me through the parking lot to my car. I panicked and finally broke into a run. Scrambling to get out my keys, I could hear his steps speeding up behind me. I leapt to my car and popped Bell and my pup in, glancing up to see Trenchcoat Guy, now walking up to me and blocking my exit. The smile was gone from his face, and I was screaming to get into my car with my, when my hero, a true gift from above, intervened. Trenchcoat Guy froze when my hero, car guard who had rounded the corner afterwards, and who must have noticed me running away from this creep, yelled out at him. He jogged up to us and put himself between me and the trench coat guy, who backed up and donned that smile again. 
that seemingly kind and innocent smile that now sent shivers through me. I wasted no time leaping into the seats of my car, still in full panic mode, and speeding out there, while trench coat guy and the car guard seemed to be arguing. I wasn't going to stick around. I practically left flaming tire tracks as I sped off and home, cold ball in my stomach, growing heavier and heavier as I went over my interactions with the guy. Speaking like a gay man to make me feel at ease, seeming to be worried about a lost dog to endear himself to me, willingly offering up personal information about himself to try and get me to open up to him, the probing questions, his overly friendly and smooth demeanor, his strange clothes, my precious bells continued unease around the man, using my politeness to continue to stick around me, and finally, my gut instinct telling me something was off from almost the start. Whoever that man was, he was a predator, and worse, he had been so discreet and subtle, he had made me question my instincts about him from the start. I had encountered plenty of flat-out creeps, some of which had attempted to follow me home, but this man, and how he acted, filled me with an unfathomed sense of fear. He was unassuming, cunning and intelligent in his approach, which showed a carefully thought-out plan to get me or other women. This made that man by far the most terrifying creep I have ever encountered, and it was months before I felt comfortable enough to go back to the park, now armed with a taser and pepper spray. The only upside in all this, the car guard who had intervened was there when I went back and approached me. I thanked him repeatedly and he took my hand and said if I ever felt unsafe that he would have my back and I was to come to him or his colleagues if anything like that ever happened again. I would be lying if I said I hadn't cried a little. That man saved me and he was alert enough to notice my distress. He helped me feel more secure going back to the park and I loved that was almost entirely ruined by trench coat guy. When I was five, my family attended a church with two stories. Downstairs were the nursery and Sunday school rooms. Upstairs was the main church room where the service was held, as well as some offices, a kitchen and a library. The main doors opened onto a stairway connecting the two levels. After Sunday school, kids would either continue playing downstairs until their parents came to get them, or if they were old enough and patient to go home like me, could go find their parents upstairs and try to convince them to stop talking and leave. My mum would spend what felt like hours talking to people after the service, so sometimes I'd go up and down the stairs a couple of times, up to ask if we could leave, back down to play when she said no, not yet, repeat again maybe 10 times and 10 minutes later. One Sunday, during one of my trips up the stairs, there was an elderly couple standing outside the glass doors, smiling and waving at me. I remember thinking maybe they'd been locked out somehow and wanted to come in, which was a silly thing to think since the doors were never locked during the hours church was open. Wanting to be helpful, I went and opened the door and told them they could come in. Turns out they didn't want to come in and instead told me they were my grandparents there to pick me up. They confused me as I was familiar with both sets of grandparents and these people were not either. I told them that no, they weren't my grandparents. At this point, I was thinking they just had me confused for another kid and said so. Then they quickly stated they meant they were my great grandparents and we hadn't met since I was a baby so I wouldn't remember them and my parents had asked them to drive me home since they were busy. Even, in a, even if I hadn't been smart enough to realize they could have just come in if they wanted. That at least seemed odd to me. And even as they protested it wasn't necessary, I said I was going to ask my parents and headed up the stairs. My mum was still talking to a group of other churchgoers, but after literally tugging on her sleeve for probably a minute, I was able to get her attention and announce loudly, and at that point probably impatiently, that my great grandparents were there to pick me up and was I supposed to go with them? She looked confused and concerned and told me my great grandparents were not there to pick me up since they were all dead, which pretty quickly put a stop to the discussion about raising money for a stained glass window or whatever. 
My mom and some other adults went with me back to the door, but the couple was no longer there. Since I couldn't really describe them any better than old, white hair, looked friendly but not my grandparents, it was just sort of uneasily put down to them mistaking me for someone else. From then on, despite my impatience to leave, I stayed downstairs until my parents came to get me. I remember being concerned about it for a while, but my mom would discourage discussing it, saying they just made a mistake. It's possible that all it was. I've always remembered that it felt wrong how insistent they were, that they were here to pick me up. So we, boyfriend and I, moved to this place about three years ago. And one day, not long after, I was parking in the street parking, not a sign, directly in front of the building. And now a unit, and I heard a guy in his car say something along the lines of, fucking bitch, get out of my parking spot. I later realized it was my neighbor who lives with his parents next door. I brushed off. Then one night I was sitting watching TV in my living room. I see out the corner of my eye a light, which turned out to be the flame from a lighter that the same guy was using to light his pipe or joint, whatever. I know it must have been that because he was constantly smoking pot in his patio. Anyway, his car was parked in front of my living room windows and he was leaning on it and staring directly into my home. I closed the curtains, texted my boyfriend and began to feel a little uncomfortable. Well, not long after, I did laundry in the building at night. I noticed one of my underwear was missing. I was perplexed, chose not to dwell on it until the next time I had two more missing. Now I know I didn't drop them. I'm always very careful because who the heck wants to put on underwear that's hit the dirty ground? Now at that point, I put two and two together that it was him. I had also heard a quick tap on my bathroom window as I was showering at night one time. My boyfriend works nights, so I know the neighbor knew he wasn't home and I was the one in the shower. Needless to say, this guy really did a number on my psychological state. I hate going outside. He ruined my sense of safety in my own home. I ended up taping up a note on the wall in the laundry room about it being punishable by law to steal underwear and to stop doing it because we see you. After that, he backed off. Another time, I was in my car. He was parked in front of me and he looked at me as he was going in his. I gave him the do not fuck with me, I'm batshit crazy look. It can be. And he hasn't messed with me since. If he ever, I mean ever, did anything else, I would lose my shit. I know it's not a good idea, but I've been angry and depressed and bitter and anxious for far too long to deal with any more of this shit. Anyway, wanted to share because I'd like to know who else had creepy neighbors they've dealt with. I've been meaning to make a police report, but he stopped harassing me, so I just never got round to it. I feel that maybe the fact he lives with his parents might have helped too. Who knows what else someone who steals chonies is capable of doing. Very unsettling. I'm a 22 year old female from Ohio and I'm currently staying at a hotel with my dad in Maryland. Our hotel is connected to another hotel and the parking lot is pretty vast. My dad and I got into a major argument, so I left our room and went for a walk around the parking lot. This was around 11.30 p.m. and I was wearing all black. I walked to the hotel next to ours and walk up a bit of an incline and sit in this parking area. It's a bit of a ways away from the hotel but it's closer to a main road. The road isn't the busiest, but busy enough, and past the road is nothing but thick trees. I'm sitting behind a shipping container or crate, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but it was huge, way bigger than a dumpster, and my back is facing the little road that leads to the exit of the parking lot. I pull out half a blunt and start smoking it and decide to FaceTime my mom to talk about the fight. As I'm sitting there, the truck passes and I peek over my shoulder and watch it exit onto the main road. I continue talking to my mom when this car with all tinted windows drives up from the hotel to the exit, but I hear its engine is behind me for longer than the truck, and when I peek over my shoulder, I see it's now reversing. 
I think, hmm, maybe they're going back to the hotel to get something. So I continue talking to my mom. And this car reverses so much, it feels like it's on my shoulder. And it parks there right behind me. Like I'm literally breathing in the exhaust. I start telling my mom how annoyed I am that this person could have picked anywhere to park. But of course they had to park right behind me. So she tells me to move. And I decide to pack up my things in my backpack and move to the opposite corner of the parking lot. Now, my back is facing the main road, and I'm keeping an eye and safe distance between me and the car. I continue talking to my mom, when I hear the car door being slammed loudly, to the point where it scared me, making me jump a few times. The car sat there for maybe a total of 10 minutes, and I heard the door being slammed about four times. Now, I watched the car carefully, and never saw anyone leave it or get in it, I couldn't even see the door opening and shutting. But I do know that if they got out and walked to the hotel, it would have been a bit of a walk, and I would have seen them walking down the incline. The car eventually starts to move, but turns towards the hotel. It drives down the hill, crosses over to my hotel parking lot. I see all their headlights and backlights turn off, and they get on the main road through my hotel's entrance, which is lower than I'm sitting. I hope you guys can understand what I'm saying, sorry, I'm trying to help you visualize. So I stay on the phone with my mom and she kind of jokes like maybe you should go back to your hotel and I reassure her that the car has left and I'm fine. So I'm sitting there for maybe 30 or 40 minutes and I'm keeping a close eye on every car that passes behind me on the main road because I'm kind of paranoid now. So I continue talking to my mom and finally I let my guard down when all of a sudden the car enters the entrance that I'm near and it just stops. It's just sitting there. And I just say, Mom, when the car begins to turn and starts heading towards me, I immediately shoot up and run as fast as I can to my hotel. I check behind me and the car is driving down towards the hotel. And that's the last I saw of it before I got inside and got to my room. My mom told me I should report it to the front desk, but my dad told me I was overreacting. I've never had an encounter like this before. I didn't feel a bad gut feeling. I definitely felt like it was weird. At the point of the second encounter, it was midnight, and I was a girl, by myself. Also, the car had all tinted windows, so I couldn't see who was in the car. Also, I was in the part of the parking lot, it was a little ways from the either hotel. Am I paranoid? Or does that seem sketchy? I'll start by saying, this happened to me over a decade ago now, but it's one of the creepiest encounters I've had in my life. The creepy person of this story is M. M joined my elementary school late in the year, had come from a different school, and was held back a year, so older than the rest of us. I always liked hanging out with him, but he turned mean all the time, without reason. One time, he burned garbage on my porch, and another time he took my pet rat and ran away with her. Me and my friend who both had rats were together at a park and letting our rats play. It was terrifying, not knowing what he was doing to do with her, we ended up throwing her into a tree. And I found her and she was fine. I stayed away from him after that incident. Fast forward six or seven years, and I bump into M randomly at 5am at an employment service building. He seemed much nicer and we exchanged numbers and he ended up coming over that afternoon. We hung out and a girlfriend of mine came over and we smoked a little. No chemistry, just friends. Everything was fine until it got late and he asked if he could spend the night. At the time I was only 19, recently single and living by myself for the first time. My friend lived two minutes away so she never stayed over. I would be alone. I wasn't into him, and I didn't want to give him that impression, so I said no. He told me he didn't have anywhere to go, and that his mom had kicked him out. I felt really on the spot, but I stood my ground and said no, even though he was practically begging me. He asked if he could borrow my phone, which at the time was a house phone, to call his mom and asked if he could come back for the night. He used the phone and had an argument with his mom, apologizing and begging to come back. Suddenly I heard, very faintly on the other end, 
The line you have reached is not in service. Please hang up and try your call again. This is a recording. Repeating over and over. I wondered if my friend could hear it too, because she was quiet. Suddenly, the line did that awful loud <laughs> sound, saying after you've stayed on a disconnected line for too long. It was so loud, it blasted through the phone, and he was like, oh, that, that's weird. I was so nervous now, to so just get him out of my fucking apartment. I rushed him out of there, told him that someone I was recently seeing was coming over, and he would be pissed if he saw him there. Thank the Lord that M left. As soon as he left, I asked my friend if she heard the recording, and she hadn't heard it. She didn't feel any of the nervousness I did. M called me so many times after that, and messaged me on F Facebook years later when that was a thing. I just blocked him. This isn't as creepy as some of the stories on here, but I'm just so glad I got him out. Because with this ingrained, violent personality, and the lying to sleep in my apartment, who knows what could have happened. What a slime ball. When I was 23, I used to run the youth theatre at local Theatre Royale. It was an old, old building, from the Georgian period at least. Baroque, 1700s, etc. It was beautiful. Dark green and red with great facades and that lovely musty theatre smell. I could spend all my time there, happily. But I hated being there alone, which I often was, to prepare shows or to set up my session. There's a lot of prep that goes into a show. I had a key, so I could let myself in. And if no one could meet me, I would have to do this alone. It would take me a lot of courage to go alone, I can tell you that. Anyway, the foyer was fine. It was renovated and new and fresh, and nothing ever happened in there. It felt welcoming and modern. Upstairs in the old bar was a bit different, but nothing too bad. This was on the first floor, second if you're American. I still didn't like being in the old bar alone, but thankfully it was only used for meetings, so I rarely was. The third floor? Forget about it. This was where the tech room was kept, a small two-person room that was permanently boiling hot from the equipment except when it wasn't. This room had been the tech room since the age of literal gas spotlights, and Jeff, the tech manager, was certain the gaslight technician enjoyed his job so much that he never left. He would often be up there, apparently, in the boiling hot tech room, and it would suddenly turn as cold as a freezer. Tech would malfunction and crew members would laugh it off and blame old equipment and damp. Jeff and I knew better. In front of the tech room was the raked balcony of chairs, and one of them was permanently kept down. This chair, right in front of where Jeff looked out to see the stage whilst doing his job during a show, was reserved for Abigail. It was taken as read that if that chair was ever up, Abigail would mess with the theatre. Even the cleaners left that chair down and it permanently had a reserved sign taped to it. Someone once said a theatre is not a theatre without ghosts. I don't know what it is about them. Perhaps the intense range of emotions actors have to portray and audiences feel create a spiritual vacuum. Almost every theatre has at least one ghost. Theatre Royal had at least three, and not all of them were as friendly as Abigail. So when going around and setting up, I had to walk through the auditorium to get to the dressing rooms and the rehearsal rooms, etc. Even with all the lights on, it was always just dim and cold. I always had an overwhelming feeling when walking through the backstage area that I shouldn't turn around and look up to the balcony. Abigail was waiting. I would sing loudly to keep myself calm. All the show tunes I could think of. I'm not a great singer, thanks to larynx polyps, but it was enough to keep me calm. I was usually so lost in my to-do list that I could fight the overwhelming urge to look up at that seat. Then, one day whilst painting the flats for our production of Wizard of Oz, I suddenly forgot all the words to Defying Gravity, my go-to song for keeping calm. 
Before I knew what was happening, I had turned around and looked up at the balcony because I felt compelled to. I couldn't fight it anymore. It was like Abigail was calling to me. And there, unsurprisingly, was a woman in Victorian garb sitting patiently in the top right of the balcony on the seat that was always kept down for her. She didn't do or say anything. She didn't move. And I nervously smiled at her and went back to my painting. She wasn't a threat, and she was clearly watching me being the old staged life. Our youth theatre productions were always anticipated due to their brightness. Abigail seemed to think so. She liked my singing, according to the theatre managers, who were quite familiar with her. After that, I made a point of saying hello to her when I went into the auditorium. She never said anything, but I knew she was always there. That's the first ghost. The friendly theatre-goer, happy to keep me company. She was only ever in the auditorium, and rarely moved from her seat. The backstage area was okay. Always freezing, but okay. It was only the boys' dressing room that gave me the heebie-jeebies. It was the smaller dressing room, and we only used it for the boys because we had only three versus the ten-plus girl in the bigger dressing room. I hated being in there alone, and would sing even louder when setting up costumes and makeup for rehearsal, or using the small cubicle toilet. Even with the door closed, I always felt someone behind me in the hall, and I always expected the door to burst open. It never did, and I think that's in part to do with the mirror facing the door. This is an old superstition that mirrors reflecting an entrance will keep a spirit out. I still never spent longer than I needed to in there. The other dressing room was just fine. Just something about the boys. I wonder what it used to be before it was made a dressing room in the new refurb of the back. Whoever haunted that corridor and the stairwell wasn't malevolent, I don't think. I just always expected them to just appear, and I didn't want that to happen when I was alone, thank you very much. And then, there was the basement. The basement was where the props were kept, and it was underneath the stage, and ran beneath the streets and the auditorium. It was the oldest part of the theatre, the only bit that had never been updated over the 300 years since the theatre was built. It was beyond unwelcoming. What is it about basements? To get down there, I would have to go through a fairly large and heavy trapdoor in the wings of the stage. I would hook the door on the designated ties to keep it open, and then head down to gather the props we needed for rehearsal. And let me tell you, descending beneath the ground was terrifying. The silence, the must, the damp. I never sang because it always echoed unnaturally. It was behind another locked door that I had a key for, and the light switch was quite far inside. You'd have to go in a few meters in the dark before you could turn on the light. And it was quite old and blinked as it turned on like a literal horror film. So many times I've been down there and seen shadows whilst the light was warming up. And I always felt like someone was behind me. The basement used to be the dressing rooms back in the Victorian era. So there's lots of different rooms and corridors leading to different rooms. One of the rooms didn't even have a floor, it was just dirt. And I hated that little room. I think everyone did, because no props were ever stored there. I don't know if there was a specific spirit in the basement, it was just all the emotions from all the performances gone by, but I didn't spend more than I needed to down there. But then there was the one time the trap door slammed shut behind me. The slam terrified me so much I literally screamed for perhaps the fourth time in my whole life. I've always been pretty calm in dramatic situations, but I hated the idea of being trapped down there, even though the trap door didn't lock. It had slammed, despite being firmly on the hooks. I dropped the props I was holding, literally on the floor, and hurried to try it, and thanking all the gods, I could open it again. There was no one else in the theatre, and it was about half an hour until the kids started rolling in for rehearsal. But I didn't go down there alone after that. I got the kids to help me bring up the props. I wonder if the spirit who slammed the trap door is the same one who lurked outside the boys' dressing room. They were quite close together. The worst part? I think I know what caused the temper tramping. 
the ghost light had gone out. Those who have done drama or theatre their whole life will know most of the superstitions that come with the tradition, especially where theatre ghosts are involved. Don't whistle because you may piss them off. Don't be up on the gantry alone in case they like playing tricks. A quick Google will bring them all up, or I may post some more traditions in the comments. Anyway, a ghost light is a light in a theatre that is permanently left on so that the ghosts can feel welcome and won't mess with the performance. In Victorian theatre, it was a literal bare gaslight left in the middle of the stage and was the last thing lit when leaving and locking up after a show. Modern theatres tend to have a green glowing LED somewhere backstage that's not as expensive to run or distracting for the performance. The idea is most theatre ghosts were once performers, and a ghost light means they can perform when everyone has left. It's one of the taken for red traditions, like not saying Macbeth. Anyway, the day the trap door slammed shut, I realised after rehearsal finished that the bulb on the ghost light had gone, and I didn't know how to replace it. I hightailed it out of there once the kids had left, leaving all the lights on, and teched the theatre manager. I don't feel any more malevolence after it was replaced later that day. Like I said, theatres are superstitious and haunted places. Abigail didn't seem to mind that the light had gone out.